video we're going to review derivatives and antiderivatives. My assumption is that this is review for you, but if antiderivatives are new, that's okay. We're going to cover them in this video. Suppose I have the tangent function. Its derivative is secant squared. Antiderivative goes in the other direction. We would be starting with secant squared. Hmm, what's a function whose derivative is secant squared? Oh, that's tangent because I remember my derivatives. In calculus 2, it's really important to be able to distinguish between problems that you remember from derivatives and problems that don't quite fit the bill. For example, the antiderivative of secant to the fourth power. Hmm, a function whose derivative is secant to the fourth power. Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to this question yet. We will answer it later in the semester, but for now, I want you to have the skill to be able to recognize that we don't know quite yet, right? And that's going to be one of the main focuses of Calculus 2 class, is to take these problems that don't quite fit the bill of things you remember from Calculus 1 and to be able to figure out new strategies for dealing with those problems, such as secant to the fourth. Of course, there's many more, but that's just one example. Let's review the rules for derivatives. If two functions are added together, then it is okay to take the derivative of the first plus the derivative of the second. If a function is multiplied times a constant c, then the constant c can be pulled out just as a multiplier, and then you can take the derivative of the function itself. These two rules are called linearity. Now, what if we had two functions multiplied together, f of x times g of x, and we wanted to take the derivative of that quantity? Is it okay to just take take the derivative of the first function and multiply times the derivative of the second function. I hope that you can recognize this is completely false. You cannot do this. The correct thing to do is to apply product rule. By the way, there's a cute little way to remember this formula. If you call this one and that two, the product rule is doing one d two plus two d one. And now let's remember the quotient rule. Again, there is a cute little way to remember this. If I call the function on the top top the high function and the function on the bottom the low function, the way to remember the quotient rule formula is low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below. The final rule is the chain rule. The chain rule is used when we have one function composed inside another function, taking the derivative of the outermost function, and then you leave the inside function alone, and then multiply times the derivative of the inside function. Let's do some examples of derivatives. Well, you can see that there's a multiplication sign here. Now we have two choices in order to do this problem. We can either apply the product rule because there's a product or we can apply algebra first which is my personal preferred method. Using algebra first we simply foil everything out. Algebra makes things so much easier. Now we can use linearity. We can pull out the 3 then take the derivative of x to the 6 and then add the derivative of x squared. Taking the derivative using the power rule on each of the pieces here and the final step will be to just simplify anything you can simplify. You never have to ask for permission to simplify. Let's do another example. The derivative of x squared times e to the x. Now these guys are multiplied, so we should use the product rule. 1 d2 is the derivative of the second function. What's the derivative of e to the x? Hopefully you remember that's e to the x. That's my 1 d2 part, and then plus 2 d1. d1 is the derivative of x squared to give me 2x. If you want to write your final answer in either of these formats, that is perfectly fine. Now let's do the derivative of e raised to the x squared power. This is essentially a composition. It's not multiplication. It's the exponential and plugged into it, composed inside, is the x squared. Now this is the chain rule. The derivative of the e function is e. Then I just copy down the inside function and then I multiply multiply times the derivative of the inside function. So here's our answer. Next, we'll do a brief introduction to antiderivatives. In Calculus 1, you spent a lot of time starting with a function, and then you took the derivative in order to get f prime. In Calculus 2, we're trying to so-called go up the chain. We're looking for a function whose derivative is f. So this process of going backwards is called taking an antiderivative. And just like with derivatives, you can take them many times, derivative of that, and the derivative of that, and the derivative of that. Antiderivatives are the same way. You can just keep going up the chain taking antiderivatives. Let's do a quick example. We're going to start with f prime. What's a function that after I take 
the derivative, I get cosine. I hope you remember it's sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. Something to notice here is that there's actually more answers. Can you think of a different function? After you take the derivative, you get cosine. How about sine of x plus two? If I take the derivative of sine of x plus two, I get cosine plus zero because the derivative of two is zero. How about sine of x plus pi? Remember that pi is a constant. The derivative of pi is also zero. There are many antiderivatives, sine of x plus 365, sine of x plus e, remember that e is approximately 2.71, etc. So what we do, in order to denote that you could add any plus constant, we write plus c. Let's try to fill in the gap at the top here. What's a function that after I take its derivative, I obtain sine of x plus c. Well, a function whose derivative is sine, I hope you remember it's negative cosine. You can double check that. Cosine by itself has a derivative equal to negative sine. So the minus sign in front flips the derivative to be positive. Now how about this plus c? What's a function that after I take its derivative, I get just a constant? The answer is plus cx. You can double check that by taking the derivative. Say if I had plus 2x, the derivative is 2. Plus plus 3x, the derivative is 3, plus 10x, the derivative is 10. So any value of c, c times x, the derivative is c. And then finally, similar to the previous problem, we could have an extra plus 0. What's a function whose derivative is 0? Well, that's another constant. Usually we will use a different letter for the second constant. Now let's double check that this works. The derivative of negative cosine is sine. The derivative of cx is c. The derivative of d is 0. So it works. Normally we use these curly symbols for antiderivatives. So let's translate our chains into curly symbols. So the curly symbol you can read as an English word, the antiderivative of, here we have the antiderivative of cosine, and the dx you can read as the English phrase with respect to x. Now we already worked this out up above, sine of x plus c. Now this other leg of the chain we can also write down just to be complete here. Now this one looks interesting. It has an x letter and also a c letter, but remember we're taking the antiderivative with respect to x. c was regarded as a constant. And the answer that we got was negative cosine of x plus cx plus d. So this curly notation will be in almost every single problem for the rest of the semester. So make sure that you understand that you can easily read it as an English sentence. Now because derivatives and antiderivatives are opposite of each other, they have similar properties. If I'm taking the antiderivative of two functions added together, it's allowed to take the antiderivative of the first one with respect to x and then with the second one with respect to x to x. Also, if I have a constant that is multiplying times a function that can be pulled out of the integral, just like it can be pulled out of derivatives, just like with derivatives, these two properties are called linearity. And for now, that's it. Additional properties of antiderivatives we will figure out for the rest of the semester. That's what the whole course is about. One thing that I do want to know is how not to do antiderivatives. We cannot take the antiderivative of two functions that are multiplied. This would be completely wrong to take the antiderivative of the first piece and multiply times the antiderivative of the second piece. Because remember, antiderivatives are the opposite of derivatives. If derivatives don't work this this way for products, then antiderivatives don't work this way either. All semester. Watch out for it. Don't do it. Now we will eventually figure out what is the correct way to take two functions that are multiplied together and take the antiderivative. However, we don't have enough time in this video. Later. Stay tuned. Let's do some examples of antiderivatives. The only way to figure out this problem is to know the derivatives like the back of your hand. We get tangent plus c. In calculus 2, I should always be able to take the derivative of my answer and get the original quantity. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, and the derivative of c is 0. So there's sort of plus 0 in here that you don't see written down because we never write plus 0. I'm going to take the antiderivative of secant tangent times 
is a with respect to x. Everywhere I see an x, that's a variable. If I see a different letter, then that must be a constant. Constants can be pulled out of the antiderivative sign. You gotta ask yourself the question, what's a function that after I take the derivative, I get secant tangent? I hope you remember the answer. If you know your derivatives well, then you know that the answer is secant. Now don't forget to add plus c on the end. Remember we mentioned in the beginning secant to the fourth x. Now there is a way to do this and we will figure it out later, but the most important thing at this point is to realize that this is not the same as the antiderivative of secant squared multiplied times the antiderivative of secant squared. Please don't make this mistake. We're gonna say stay tuned, we will figure out how to do this later and it will be one of the main focuses of calculus 2. Remember our trusty power rule. If I have x raised to a power, the way that I take the derivative is by moving the power down in front and then decreasing the power by 1. Now, what does this derivative rule mean for antiderivatives? So let's write down the corresponding formula for antiderivatives. The antiderivative of px to the p minus 1 with respect to x is equal to x to the p, and don't forget our plus c constant that goes on every antiderivative we do. And now what we're gonna do is divide both sides by p. Now the p's cancel out on the left, I get a one over p on the right, and any constant divided by p is still just another constant, because p is a constant as well. The antiderivative of x to the p minus one dx is equal to 1 over p, x to the p plus c. This is essentially the power rule for antiderivatives. Now there's a slightly more useful way to write this formula. Everywhere I see a p, I'm gonna replace it with p plus one. So we get antiderivative x to the p is equal to one over p plus one, x to the p plus one plus c. This is the best formula to use if you're taking the antiderivative of a power function. Let's do some more examples. The antiderivative of x cubed times x squared plus 8. Now remember the rule. If there's a multiplication sign, we cannot proceed by taking the antiderivative of all the individual pieces here. Remember that algebra is our friend. We love algebra. Algebra makes problems easier. Do algebra first. Simplify. By simply foiling, we obtain the antiderivative of x to the fifth plus 8x cubed using linearity, and now we apply the power rule. Now here, the power is 5. I want to increase that by 1 to get x to the sixth, and then divide by 6. The 8 is a constant, so it just gets copied down. Then we're going to increase 3 to 4 and divide by 4. We should always look for things to simplify. Now remember that the answer here, I should be able to take the derivative of my answer in order to obtain the original quantity. If I take the derivative of x to the 6, the 6 comes down, cancels, and then I get x to the 5th. Haha, <laughs> this works. If I take the derivative of 2x to the 4th, the 4 comes down, multiplies the 2 to give me 8, and then the power decreases by 1 to give me x cubed. That worked too. Don't forget about the plus c. If I take the derivative of plus c, I get 0. So that worked as well. So I hope this video is challenging you to really know your derivatives. As you can see in Calculus 2, we're doing derivatives forwards and backwards and backwards and forwards. So if you don't know which way things are going, or you don't remember your derivatives from Calculus 1, you're gonna be in big trouble. So make sure you know that stuff. There's another category of functions that you might remember from Calculus 1, the inverse functions. How about arctan and arcsine? I'm gonna do some antiderivatives with those. And I hope that you remember what those derivatives are. If you don't, you might want to pause the video and go get a list of derivatives to be handy at your side. Now, there's even more derivatives that I hope you remember from Calculus 1. I'm going to formulate them in antiderivative format. So, I'm looking for a function whose derivative is 4 over 1 plus x squared. That 4 can be pulled out of the antiderivative sign. So really the question is, what's a function whose derivative is 1 over 1 plus x squared? I hope that you remember what that is. It's arctangent. Don't forget the plus c. And let's do one more. The antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 9 minus 9x squared. You should notice, because I trust you're good at algebra by this stage, that there's a couple of 9s in here that can easily be factored out and then taken the square root of. Always begin with algebra if algebra is going to help you. Here, I can factor 
factor out the 9, remember that the square root of two things multiplied is the square root of the first times the square root of the second, so we can separate these pieces. Now this is essentially a 3 in the denominator, and I can pull that out of the integral sign. I expect you know it from calculus 1 is the arc sine function. And finally, don't forget your plus C. Now one of the key points that I hope you got out of this video is that it's really important to utilize algebra in order to help you get through a problem. If a problem is going to be easier by foiling at first, that's up to you. Nobody's going to tell you how to foil it. you got to figure that out for yourself. If there's an extra 9 hanging around that you can take the square root of like in the last problem we did, again, that's up to you. You have to know your basic algebra. You should be able to look at a problem and say, hmm, this would be a little bit easier if I rearrange the terms using valid algebra. So don't forget, algebra is your friend. Algebra makes things easier. Always watch out for things that can cancel out, terms that can foil to make the problem easier for you. Now this is just the beginning, right? This is the introduction to antiderivatives. There's even more that we'll be covering in class. So remember that the video is not the entire lecture. We're going to be doing more of these things in class. So check out the homework, read the book before you get to class, and I'll see you soon.